Uh, I'll present what I've been doing for the past seven years in a multilingual translation class. Uh, first, though, I should explain why I've been doing it. I've been working at what was then called the Monterey Institute for International, of International Studies in California, a CUT school for training translators and interpreters like this one. High levels, very specialized training for very small groups of students, and the master's program is expensive there, so you're not going to get a sudden influx, influx of students in Now, one of the solutions to that was to have students do their translation practicum uh, individually, with individual professors. And I had two students from the Spanish program for my first year there, and they were just working with me individually. It took a lot of time, a lot of effort. And I saw that there was no way these people, oh, sorry, could go out on the market straight away and work. And this is in their second year of masters when, in theory, they're going to do it. Uh, and I asked them why, and they said, they're going so slow. And they're looking up everything. I said, well, you have to go faster. Or you're not going to make any money out there, and people are going to worry because you're so slow. And they are so scared of making a mistake because if we make two mistakes, we get a B instead of an A, and a B is worth you know, the value doesn't fail. Uh, nobody had worked on their translation process. They had lots of attention to accuracy, strong area knowledge, strong language competence, but how they translated was not the professor's main concern, and they were evaluated on product, not process. And one of the reasons the institution was going broke was because I had two students. Right? Uh, my first year there, I, I was actually there to um, design a doctoral program for them, which they decided not to do. And I made some other suggestions because I had to go through the entire program. And uh, I made other suggestions. Said, Look, you could save money by putting these students together because they do that in conference interpreting. In the conference interpreting practicum, all languages are together, they listen to each other, they all comment on each other, they form a community. So, well, it works for interpreting, why not do it for translation? So the reasons were firstly financial, secondly, I could deal with aspects that were not being looked at in other classes, namely process instead of product. Okay. Thirdly, it was clear that the conference interpreting students had a community because they did the practicum together, because they deal with the same kind of mistakes, but there was no community for the translation students, that is written translation students. They were in separate language programs. They had no idea about the kind of theory or techniques being done in the other language program. They had no idea about how the other languages worked. I noticed that all the Asian students think that all European languages are similar, very easy, okay? Whereas the European students had not a clue about what was happening in the Asian languages. Uh, and they weren't talking with each other in Europe. And the uh, third aim there, which is really what I thought I was brought in to do, um, I could see this as a way of introducing research into the training process. That is, to get the students to do research on themselves and on each other. Uh, so, those are the various circumstances and the aims. Here is, I don't think you can see it very well, can you? Uh, this is the group I had uh, last semester, fall semester. Uh, what you need is a big table, like that, 16 people around it. Uh, laptops, don't get, don't ever do this in a computer lab where you've got people lined up in front of you, you can't see what they're doing, it's very hard to get access to them. <coughs> there, I can walk around the back of them, and I'll just try to remember, Chinese, 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 Korean, Chinese, Korean, Korean, what did you change places, okay. Chinese, Chinese, Japanese, but American, Japanese, uh, Japanese, 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 Spanish program, and French program. Okay, so the languages I can deal with are the Spanish and the French. And I've got a lot of Asian languages that I don't know. 
I, I, you know, I've been doing it for seven years, so I start to realize what the problems are, and I know the kind of syntactic issues they're dealing with, but I'm certainly not going to grade a translation done to or from those languages. Okay? Perhaps into English I could make some comments on that. Um, and they're all happy, you will notice. Perhaps in the real photo. Okay. Now, the principles of that class were as follows, and I'm going to give you this version now. This is after seven years of trial and error. Okay, so at the beginning I was doing lots of things that I've just left out. Uh, it has to be task-based. I don't go in and give any particular theory. I'll present a problem. It might be, do you know what the difference is between translating into A and translating into B? Okay, we're looking at directionality. But I'm not going to come in and say, don't translate into B, because, or always translate into A, or theorist X says this, etc. No, I just, do you know? No, we don't. Let's find out. Okay, it's an invitation to not just research, but self-discovery. Uh, for many of these, especially the Asian language students, they do translate into English. They will have to translate into English, uh, whether or not we like it. So it, it's good that they learn about that and what it means, okay? Uh, the students have to work in twos and threes. That is, it, it doesn't help me to have one Japanese student in the class. I have to have two. Why? Because they're going to do peer review and work with each other. They're going to work in those groups. So I have to insist. If I've got one Japanese, that's no good. Uh, it's okay for the Spanish and French because I can work with those languages. That is, we self-assess each other. I, I actually do the, do the activities. Uh, so peer review is the only possible check we can have on product quality. But the focus of the course is not on product quality. It's on process. A whole lot of questions about process that at the time were not being dealt with in the parallel courses that, that, that they were taking. Um, unfortunately, what's happened over the years is I've started to experiment with various ways of reflecting or investigating process, as some of the other teachers have started to do what I was doing, so I lost my just justification. Okay. And uh, the third point is, is really just that although it's about using research as a learning process, um, it's not coming in and giving them anything prior to that. We discover <coughs> what they find there and now on their own particular, on the basis of their own particular performances. Okay. Now, um, in terms of research, these will be the variables that we look at. There are, it's an open list. Uh, many of them I, I take at the beginning of each course in a uh, in translation studies, a course called Overview of Translation Studies, I asked people to write three things they would like to know about translation and interpreting. I did the same thing here with the, with the Ring Vorlesung in the BA group. So I have all these questions that students ask. My idea is that theory and research should answer those questions. And I know we're not doing it very well. Uh, anyway, on the basis of those questions, I can get the variables that are of interest to people. One of the main concerns of any translation student these days is technology. What are we going to do with translation memories? That's okay. What about machine translation? How do we deal with that? How do we work with it? Is this my enemy? Is it my friend? Okay. Uh, so plus or minus that is of interest. Directionality I've mentioned because it's a market demand for many languages these days. Speed is something that they're not trained in in other courses. And so I know it's something they're going to need in the industry, so that's there. Um, because of the reliance on translation technologies, a huge market demand is revision and editing practices, uh, which would include uh, post-editing, but we can also experiment with pre-editing. This means put it through uh, statistical machine translation, terrible result. Okay, what do you say? Oh, terrible result, the machine can't translate. No. You compare what the machine does with what you do post-editing. 
Is it quicker to post-edit or quicker to translate from scratch? Okay, that's the first experiment we do. Do you know the answer? Could you imagine? It depends. It depends on the language pair, actually. For Japanese-Korean, it's not much of a benefit. For the other languages, it is. Okay? And then we can go one step further and use pre-editing. Let's rewrite the source text in simple syntax. You know, remove uh, passives, remove complex uh, dependency clauses, and put it through the machine. Is the result much better? Yes. Does that save time? And we can add up the times and find out how to work with technology. They're quite simple things to do, really. Another activity concerns authorship. It has to do, it follows off from the revision process. You know, how much can I change a text? Some people at the beginning like to change everything, as you might have discovered. Uh, what I do, well, no, I'm going to go through and I'll show you the actual activities and invite comments on it. Basically, that involves every student writing a 200-word story, the most wonderful moment in my life. Uh, no sexual topics are allowed. The, the Chinese students can't handle that. So we know what's happening. And it sounds banal, but I mean, it's something very close to the student's experience, and often it's, it's quite touching, and they write really well. And then they translate each other. And then they revise the translation. And they compare how the author revises it, their text when translated to how a third person does it. And you find that authorship has all these affective property type relations. It's my experience, it's my text. Or it's all correct, but it's not right. Uh, and it's a way of exploring, uh, I think, respect for authorship. I think the takeaway they get at the end of that is, is to let the text have its voice. Don't try to make it sound like you. Realize that there's another experience there in the other language. But we'll get to that in a minute. And there's a simulation exercise that takes two weeks. Uh, but that's two sessions, four, it takes four hours. Uh, translated client relations, I'll, I'll explain that in some detail. We do some subtitling because it's good fun. Uh, and this, this, this last uh, session, not in this group, but actually in Tarragona in Spain, uh, we looked at uh, crowd translating. I got them to go in and, and do some work on Facebook to see how that works, how the crowd, um, crowd translation works. Uh, crowdsourcing, crowd translation uh, works in Facebook, and that's good fun as well. And, and it's, it's available in all those languages. There are parts of Facebook that are not made, yet to translate it. That's the first lesson. It says, the aim of this experiment is to show that we can discover things about our translation processes independently of the languages we're working with. Okay. Uh, and they have a 200-word text. Half the class does it through Google Translate and post edits, and the other half does it from scratch. Okay. So they're in their pairs, and we keep a track of how long they take. But do you use the cat tool? No. No cat. Not for that one because it's it, it's it's it, it, there's no memory okay. to put into it. Okay. Um, I should add, in general, I, I do insist that they always use a, a translation memory uh, of any kind. I don't care which one, but they should use it as a baseline yeah. methodology. Uh, and you'll see later that there's particular exercises on. I don't like the term cap tool, because all translation is computer-aided these days. Yeah? Oh, okay, yeah, that's true. So, I, you know, a translation <laughs> okay. memory is a translation memory. And, but the industry still uses, uses the term. Yeah, we're there to fix up the industry. <laughs> no, I mean, meta language, I mean, okay, it's something that made sense in, in the early 1990s, perhaps. Okay, all right, doesn't, okay. doesn't matter. Um, it's the first class, I don't want to make it too complicated. I want them to see how it's going to operate, okay. and to get the idea that we're going to discover stuff we don't know, so I keep it as simple as possible. And the text is very simple, I think. Now, I must admit, I have one big advantage here. These students all have English at a very good level. So we have a, a common working language. Like ours have German. 
so. We hope so. It's the same. Okay. Same position. Yeah, same but position. I know in, in in my MA group, I have one student who doesn't have good English, and it makes all the it's very hard to hard to explain. Yeah, you've got you, of course. So there's no excuse. <laughs> uh, let's see what it says here. Please translate the following text for publication in Wikipedia. Okay. It's, it's a technical text about cyberspace. It's not something they can do without looking around for, for some information. Um, there's a reason for that. It's because the machine translation system, statistical machine translation, will give them very good terminology. And actually, I want them to discover that they go faster with machine translation than without. And I do that by putting terminology in the text. It's a technical text. Uh, it's one of the secrets of machine translation, statistical machine translation. It's good on terminology. Pretty bad on syntax. But if you know what's going on, you can repair the syntax. Okay, so what we do is each student then uh, times how long they took to do it. Half of them, like one Japanese student, is translating from scratch in the normal way. Okay, looking up on Google whatever they need. Okay, and the other one is putting it through and then post editing, repairing it. And we see who's faster. And then they revise each other's text. So we get a score for speed and a score for quality. Okay. It's rough. It's not, it's, it's not exact science. But I just want them to get the idea we can discover stuff. How do we assess quality? Well, they get each other's text and they go, th they've translated the same text, so they know the text. Yeah? They go through and they use track changes and then they add up how many things they change. It's a rough thing, it's not scientific, and it'll get them discussing about it between themselves, because then afterwards they say, hey, but you put that, but this is not right. And every time the student is arguing with the student, I think that's great pedagogy. Uh, I just sit back. They're discussing translation. People learn from discussing translation. And are the teams the, the same people during the whole term, or no? Uh, it doesn't have to be. Uh, it depends on the languages. But what is your experience? Uh, they tend to stay with they their partner. Yeah, okay. or, or three. I had three Korean students there. They always work together. Okay. And, and they just revise by, mm -hmm. by passing it around uh, that way. The aim of the course, I have to stress that, is not to produce perfect translations, because we can't assess uh, um, quality. I don't have the competence to, to enter into that process. So the peer review here is not just to add up which is really rough because not every error has the same weight, that's obvious. It's a good thing to discuss. That's why they argue to get that. But then I asked them, are there particular errors that you think are there because of the machine translation? And usually you'll find syntactic literalism or the post-editing was complicated and it's a little bit left out of place. So uh, usually, for, especially for the Asian languages, it's possible to identify kinds of errors that are typically due to working through with machine translation. Okay, and that's that's why we do look at the product. Otherwise, I could throw it away. Okay. Generally, I can show that, except for Japanese and sometimes Korean, it is faster to post edit. Is this a valid conclusion across the board? No, because it all depends on the text type. Uh, and the, the, uh, the status of the database for that language. But is it enough to get them accustomed to the possibility that they might work with machine translation? Yes. And they can never say, ah, Professor Pim told us to work with machine translation because my colleagues would kill me if they heard that. <laughs> you know, my, my other colleagues are excluding this, good, no touch Google, it's bad, etc. All right. That's good. You have to learn how to translate from scratch. You need that. But you also have to know what the technology can do and what it can't do. And by not dealing with the technology, we're condemning them to a life of ignorance. We move on to translation memories. Um, at Monterey, they can all use Trados because they've done, they have to do it in the first year. These are second year students. 
Uh, lots of them don't like trade-offs because they don't want to buy it for themselves because it's too expensive. I don't like trade-offs because of the high price. It's a wonderful tool to use, but it's hard to get used to, etc. And I encourage them to try other things and see what they like. So this is a class where I give them two hours in which to learn a translation memory system suite that they've never used before. Okay, they can all use one. I know that. Now I say, go off and explore another one. Okay. Here's a text. You have two hours. Pick up this, learn how to use it, do the translation, and hand in your translation in it's actually two hours, it's 50 plus 50. It's 100 minutes that they have to do this. Work in pairs. Absolutely key. Anything with technology, don't get students by themselves. They get blocked, they look at the screen, they get nervous, they feel stupid. If they're working in pairs, at least they'll discuss it and they call me in if they need their help. Okay. Uh, now, what have we got here? So, this is, it changes every year because this technology changes every year. You know, you ask them, anybody using anything? Do you like it? Should we take a look at it? So we had MemoQ, which I like very much. XTM Cloud, I have no idea how that works. Snowball is a piece of rubbish, but I give that to the good student to give a really critical evaluation. I hope this is not recorded too bad. Okay. Word, uh, WordFast is great. WordFast Anywhere is, is web-based. And Omega T is great too. Okay, so I ask them to do that in two hours. They have to hand in the translation and then write a critical assessment of the uh, translation to, of the translation memory. Okay, they actually do that afterwards because they don't have enough time. Oh, sorry. One of the principles of the class is that everything happens in the two-hour session. There's no homework unless they don't finish. Like in this case. They, they won't get through in time, uh, and I want I want that I want them to learn how to learn fast. I want that bit of element of time pressure there, uh, because that's the skill that's going to help them with technology, not knowing how Trados works, but being able to transfer that knowledge to any other tool. And they all do it, some faster than others. The good students finish early, but not the others, which is a, a logical principle as well. Good. Time on task. This is real process stuff. Now, step one, I get them to download a screen recorder. Screen recorders are free. If you've got a lovely Mac like that, you can use QuickTime to do it. Okay. If not, I use uh, BB Flashback or Camtasia. There are probably others out there, but these are free to download. And BB Flashback is great, except it doesn't work with a Mac. Camtasia does work with a Mac. Or quick time. Okay. Uh, why do I do that? The students are going to do a translation and record what they do on the screen, and then play it back and figure out how long they spent on each task. Um, the BB flashback one is great. You can record what happens on the screen. You can get keystroke logging as well if you want it. We don't need it for this. And you can get a video of the student's face as they translate. If you want to see anguish and problem recognition going, sometimes that's fun for them to look at themselves while they're translating. But in general, we just use what's on the screen. Okay. And the tasks are have to. The, the big trick here is you have to explain the tasks very carefully because they don't get it right. Everything you do before you translate the first word. So it's a pre-translation phase. Okay, we used to teach students to read the whole text, look up the terminology, decide on your scopos. I don't know what you do. How long do you do that? Okay. Then from the translation of the first word through to the translation of the last word is your drafting phase. Okay, that's the main translation phase. But within that, then you're going to take out your documentation activities, which is defined as all the time you spend out of your work environment, which might be Word, or it might be MemoQ, or whatever work environment you are, when you go out to Google something or get some information. They're calling that documentation, you could call it whatever you like. But 
you add up those times. And then after the word, you have a revision phase, where revision means checking the whole document. Revision doesn't mean the minor loops you, you, you use in the actual translation process. So there's pre-translation, drafting, documentation, and revision. Okay. Defined very carefully. They'll all get it wrong the first time. They'll all mix it up. They won't know what to do. Okay. But when they've done it once, and they get the numbers for it, you say, oh, look, you have a translator style. Look, some of you spend a long time on the pre-translation phase. Some of you spend a long time on the post-translation phase. Some of you are looking up everything. Why is somebody going twice as fast as somebody else? Let's see the numbers. You get them to check it with each other. And somebody will realize straight on, hey, I'm looking up everything and my colleagues are not. This is why I'm going slow. Somebody might realize, hey, I'm not looking up anything and my colleagues are. This is why I'm getting lots of mistakes. Okay? Uh, so it's a very simple tool to use. Uh, it takes a bit of statistics. People have to add up and subtract. I don't know, language students tend not to be good at adding up and subtracting. But sometimes you get a crazy result and you say, did you add it up correct? Oh, no, I did. Okay. Teach them to add up. But this is empirical research. I, I use a tool, uh, a simple analysis, it's from uh, Brian Mossop, who, who wrote the book on revision and editing, editing and revision for translators, revising for translators. He took it from uh, writing analysis, uh, analysis of the way people write. So you've got these four <coughs> translator styles. The student can be, can I remember it, an architect, Okay, a long time planning, a long time planning. I mean, once the house is built, you can't change anything. So lots of planning, nothing after it. That's an architect. Uh, Bricklayer, long time to get everything to ready, ready. You build it quickly, and then you spend a long time afterwards cleaning it up. So bricklayer, lots of preparation, fast translation, lots of revision. Uh, then you have watercolorists. No watercolors. You have to paint quickly, and you and you can't touch it up afterwards. So you know these are the inspirational translators. It's done. Uh, not much preparation. Not much revision. And the final one are the oil color, oil colorists, painting in oils where you can put white over black. All right. Uh, and so the oil painters will spend a long time revising. They'll do a quick translation. So you, you get the students to sort of say which they are. Most are watercolorists or oil painters, surprisingly. Uh, and then um, you point out that there's no recipe. There's no research that says it's better to be one or the other. There, you know, there are at least four styles. and It's like there are learning styles or people who work better with visual memory or, or acoustic or... You know, there's no, no research that says any of these is better. But let's see what you are. If you like, you can try to change your style. Then the next one we do, try to be a, a, a watercolorist and see if that feels good, if you get a better result and you're, you're happy with it. Uh, but I don't oblige them to do that. I just suggest that if they're not happy with what's happening, try a different style. It's not high size, but the, the terms are labels that they can remember, and that helps them as well. Okay, I move on to di directionality. Uh, this is done in, in the other classes, in the Asian languages. It's not done in the European languages, uh, because the market doesn't have the same requirements in those languages. So I think we have to be aware that there are different market requirements for different language combinations out there, and, and just be aware. Not tell anybody, never translate into your B language, uh, because they will have to in some cases. This is hard to prepare because I have to get students going both ways. Okay, so um, I take um, an event that happens on that day in the newspaper. It's got to be current, it's got to be the same for everybody. This is to have a level playing field, and it's reported in all the newspapers that morning. So I go around the newspapers and pick up the report on that event. 
and I take the first 200 words. It's a short text, okay? So they're all translating the same event, but reported as, as star text in these different languages. And they're all going to go into English, okay? Except for the English students. No, no, because they all have to go both ways. Okay? So there will be a text on the same event going into their A language and going into their B language. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it takes two weeks. Sometimes I do going into A the first week, then going into B the second week. Uh, I manage to get it in a two-hour class, one hour going into A, and the second hour going into, into B, and there is still time to translate it. One Mando goes into A, the other into B. Do you use A, B languages? Is that okay? Uh, third member can choose what they want to do. It's like a game of cards, isn't it, really? Okay, then they play back the performance and they do the time on task analysis. So they've now seen the two people, they're different, but they, uh, they can um, compare how they distributed their effort over the tasks in relation to the directionality. Did the directionality affect the way they, they approach the text? Usually it does, in a major way. Uh, if you're going into B, you spend more time documenting. Okay. Uh, you tend, it's also a quality because then they revise each other and you tend to find that going into B you play it safe with the terminology they'll use a lot more generalization a lot more strategic omission and, and things like this that, yeah, now I did that in one session that's two hours because I had the working pairs one into A, one into B it's also possible to do it over two weeks the second week they reverse then they compare what they did going into A with what they did going into B for the same student. Two, did you change translator style? Okay. So once again, I'm not giving them theory. I don't know what they're going to discover. They have to discover that for themselves. You could add other questions there. Would you translate professionally into your B language? Or how do you feel about it? You could ask them other questions. But I think it's important there to not give them what they should find, let them discover it for themselves. And you find some people who just say, quite frankly, I feel uneasy going into B, I will never do this. I, I suffered. Okay, fair enough. We got into it. Okay, th this is an exercise that brings together the previous things that have been done. It's accumulative. They now know how to do the time and task. Uh, they know how to analyze their translator style. Now I ask, when you translate fast, how do you do that? How does your translator style go? And um, to get them to translate fast is quite hard. I've experimented with this, and here's what I do at the moment. It's not a good solution, but it's the best one that I've found so far. Uh, you get them to take the previous translation that they did into A, and you get the time they took. They're all 200 word texts, okay? About the same level of difficulty. And that's their baseline. I'm not going to say everybody translates at the same time. This is you, you know, you're 22 minutes, you're 18 minutes, that's okay. Now, I'm going to get you to go 30% faster. Let's do that calculation and tell me what 30% is. And that's what you're aiming for. I know this because I know they can go 30% faster, but without cracking up, you know, without steam coming out of their ears or the whole thing going off the tracks. And then I just pressure them by telling them the time as I walk around the back until they get nervous and the adrenaline gets going. And it gets quite intense. They're really panicking. Them. Uh, and they all finish on time. They can do it. But you could, you could try a class by going, you know, 15%, then 20 then 25 etc., until they explode. <laughs> if you want to really do the experiment. Uh, and in fact, the, the research, the empirical research that's done on speed does work that way. I just pick 30% because I, I know it's going to work. Uh, now, because they've recorded it, you can show them they can go faster. To peer review, I can show them that they're not making significantly more errors, which is interesting. And uh, then we ask how. How did you do it? Go back and do the time on task analysis. And, of course, they find. I cut down on the pre-translation almost entirely, but I knew that. It's only 200 words, so you don't need a lot of pre 
in translation. I cut down on the documentation almost entirely. They learned to trust their intuition. And that's, that's the big thing to get across to them. And then the revision process was generally not reduced that much. They still need revision. They've learned that, that you're going to have to read over that text to make sure it's going there, especially if they're using the translation. Okay. Uh, I don't tell them that. They have to def- tell it to me at the end. What recommendations would you give to a translator who wanted, know how, wanted to know how to translate faster without making too many mistakes? So I put them in the position of the expert giving advice to somebody who doesn't know what they now know. And you get really good recommendations. Will it make them go faster? I don't know. But it will give them the confidence to push themselves and to trust their intuition, which I think is, is half the battle. I think that's what we acquire, actually, from our practice, learning self-confidence. It's a very hard thing to communicate. You can't give it in a theory class. You can't tell people, be confident. It doesn't work. It has to come from actually doing it and discovering, yes, I can go for it. And I just had a really brilliant student who, she had a background in education science. I don't know why she come in there. And um, we did the experiment, and the whole of my methodology is based on separating the tasks. And she said, something along the lines of, yes, I went fast because your category is no longer applied. That she was multitasking. The, the categories blended into each other. She found it very hard to separate them and then realized it was because they were really blended. There. And I thought that was wonderful because I, I realized that when I do this methodology to study speed, my categories are going to break down. Now that I'm imposing a way of thinking that is contradicting what's actually happening. And to get that kind of feedback from a student really helps me in the research process. This is where they have to bring to class a 200-word text that they've written in their A language about the most wonderful moment in their life, avoiding sensitive topics, as you can see there. And then they... Each, they are authors, they give the text to be translated into English, because they have the A language, non-English, used in most, not all of them. And as I said before, that translation is then revised, first by the author and second by a third person. Okay, so it's quite a complex activity, but once they get used to this way of working, they can handle that. And then you compare the revisions. We're not going to criticize the translator. The translator did what they could do. We're looking at who revises the most, who revises too much. And guess who revises most, the authors or the third parties? The authors, almost all the time. And it's, it's for them to realize that there is this effective, protective, property-type relationship between authorship and the text. What you do with that, I don't really know. What I'm hoping to do, I said before, is to make them sensitive, not revise too much, not revise to the extent of changing the voice of the text, have respect for authorship. This is in a day, an age, where we proclaim translators are authors, translators know best, translators can improve the text. All that's true, I think. But there are still authors. And there is still an effective relationship with creativity which isn't the same for translators working on it. I just give the exercise, they do it, they draw the conclusions. Who revised the most? The author. How does it feel to be translated? That's, that's a nice question. And, and mostly, you know, I mentioned before, they, they get this thing, it was correct, but it didn't feel like me. It didn't feel right. It feels uneasy. And then... Um, Will this change the way you translate? I'm afraid most of the answers are no, not really. But we try. I took that idea for the assignment from Andrew Chester. Okay, it's not mine. I steal ideas when they're good. 
This is the one class where I do give a bit of theory. Uh, it's on revision or reviewing. Because in the industry, there are so many different names for the same thing. Is it the 101 most beautiful names for Allah? So it's getting that way. And it's different in the United States from in Europe as well, in the standards that are, that are published. So I really go through, we try to figure out what all the terms mean in the different places. That's just ha helping them handle the industry, I think. Uh, and then you could do anything you like. I, I get them to... I don't, this is not every year. It depends on the, what they're interested in. Um, I get them to do copy editing, actually. I give, I give them the text, and, and I say, you know about style manuals and style guides, and I get them to use the online um, Chicago Manual of Style, for which there's a free subscription for 30 days, so they can use it for 30 days and then it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, there's lots more that can be... I, I think there should be a, a standalone course in revision editing covering all those editorial techniques, from uh, pre-edition and post-editing for machine translation right through to editorial copy editing. Uh, I think that there should be that course on publishing techniques or working with technology as well. Uh, here I, I just do a, a quite simple exercise for those who don't know about how to apply a style sheet. In other years I, I, I've done just normal revision and, and criticize each other for revision. Okay, so we move on to late October, and this is the big project that takes two weeks on translator client negotiations. One, two. I'll move to the PowerPoint for this. I've been working on risk analysis, so I'm afraid I call this credibility risk, but I don't give them that word or anything like it. I just say, hey, half of you are going to be clients and half of you are going to be translators in companies. So if I've got, if I divide you up, you know, that's one translation company, that's another translation company, you're in. Uh, clients, clients, translators, translators. Usually three or four people in each company. And the let me get this right. It, the majority are Chinese, so one of the texts is going into Chinese okay, for a European company that wants to go to China. All right? Uh, oh, yep. And the translator companies are going to have to do a translation of a sample and then present it to the clients. The clients don't know Chinese, the translation's in Chinese. Now it's not about how good your translation is. It's about how well you can sell it, how convincing you can be, how you can create your credibility in the, in the negotiation process. And then the next week it goes the other way. Uh, the Chinese are the customers instead of the, the translators. Okay? Uh, so they're in multilingual groups. The Chinese are together, the others mix them up a bit. It's okay. Um, and I, I'm going to go over this one in some detail because a Chinese student of mine from Hong Kong did her doctoral thesis on this. And so I did the activity, I recorded everything, I gave it all to her, I said, make sense of this, please. Uh, so she applied risk analysis categories to try to make sense of what I didn't see happening. We just had all this material. And um, I'll go through what she discovered first, and then I'll present what happened in class. It's a think aloud protocol. We're using basic think aloud because the student in Hong Kong is going to analyze that. Uh, the student who's translating just did the translation and recorded it. Uh, she didn't have to go and do the time and task analysis, but she could look back at it as she liked. I think she's using word fast there. Uh, that, that, that doesn't particularly matter either. No, that's okay. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, so we did the entire analysis. This then becomes a think aloud protocol. And you can measure the time taken in seconds, but more importantly for each translation problem, the number of alternatives thought about, contemplated, 
and then the selection process. So we will get, uh, some of it was done individually, some translated together. So we've got two translators here. Uh, this is another form of Thinkalar protocol, a collective, a collaborative Thinkalar protocol. And they're translating the phrase, enjoy your adventure. Uh, I should explain. The task was to take this um, grocery shop, is it? A Trader Joe's, where you buy your food. Okay. And we said Trader Joe's is going to open a, a store in Beijing. Right. Please give them advice on how to present themselves in Beijing. Uh, this is the website. The website actually has some recipes there as well, which makes it very interesting. Okay. And, um, all the students know about Trader Joe's because it's about half a kilometer from where we give the classes. And they all buy their groceries there, so they can't say they're ignorant about it. Okay. And as you can see, Trader Joe's uh, publicity in the United States is sort of Wild West adventure, fearlessness. And it's a flyer. This is a bit of, it's a, the flyer is a, a pamphlet that you get for free, which gives you really good recipes and they have really good products. I, I go shopping there too. Uh, but it's full of puns. So there's a little airplane up there, an old vintage airplane, and shopping at Trader Joe's is supposed to be as exciting as flying an old airplane or something like this. So, <laughs> right. so you get uh, phrases like, yeah, enjoy your adventure. Now, how does that work in Chinese culture? Perhaps you can help us here. The, the students were not really happy about it. Hmm, enjoy your adventure. Hmm. Love your adventure. Ha ha. Adventure is not good. Not to say adventure. How about, so it means when you come for the first time, you enjoy it, right? When you come the first time, you enjoy it. Just come once and you enjoy being here. I don't watch this going off. Right, right. Because it seems to say, come to a, a place and then you enjoy making many discoveries. So it can be translated as, enjoy the discoveries you make. Hmm, sounds good. Now, who am I to say that's a bad translation? I'm just interested in the way they negotiated this solution. Okay, and they record it, and we can analyze it. Uh, for another phrase, which is there, shop fearlessly. Shop fearlessly. <laughs> it's, there are not many cultures where you can tell people to shop fearlessly. Right. Uh, so we found solutions, and then you, Maggie, the student doing it, categorized them according to risk. So happy shopping is an adaptation of normal risk avoidance, right? It's risk adverse, there are minus. Enjoy your tour, substitution, risk averse. Wish you happiness when you do the shopping, risk averse. Enjoy your tour in the shop, risk averse. Nobody wanted to take the risk of, say, shop fields. They could have. We don't know what effect it would have had. Okay, but you can understand, uh, I assume, with your knowledge of shopping in China, that if they told you to shop fearlessly, you would think something's wrong. Yeah? Okay. So you can categorize the kinds of decisions that the students made. Enjoy your adventure there. Uh, love your adventure um, was risk, but risk transfer because it was very close to the start text here. So it relied on it, and they could tell the clients, "Look, we followed you here." Uh, and in a sense, they're not taking the risk because they can point to the text and say, "It's the, the risk is taken in the text." Whereas the translation we just saw, "Enjoy the discoveries you make," but the shift of focus is once again risk averse. Uh, I won't go into all of that, I think. No, okay. Get hungry audaciously is risk-taking. Whereas get hungry, act now, I don't know, I would say that pretty risky as well. But anyway, telling people to get hungry, shop fearlessly. Yeah. Okay, it's an interesting text, but you can understand that given the publicity campaign that they have. 
For each of the translators, uh, Maggie then had a risk profile uh, with the number of solutions uh, that they thought about and rejected, and then the ones they accepted, is it a risk-taking, risk-averse, or risk-transfer? There should be an arrow there for risk-transfer. And you could get each student, and here is their risk profile. This is the way they handle risk. I can tell you that men take more risks than women. Is that a surprise? I don't have many men in the class. Uh, Asian students take fewer risks than Western students. Which is interesting. So, fem I'm sorry, female Asian students, at least in, the, in my classes, uh, tend to be the most risk of us. Uh, I, it's what we find, and you can say, look, this is what we found. Hey, take risks. Or you guys, don't take so many risks, okay? But it's, it's also a way of holding up a mirror and saying, look, this is what we found. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't matter. You don't, you don't like to do anything with it. But you might be interested in this. There's a kind of mirror. Now, here is uh, one of my Chinese students, perhaps, presenting her translation. Them for the adapting to marketing strategy. And for example, first keep the trademark. Because, for example, trademark is really important, and if so, that's the reason I emailed you to ask whether you have registered your trademark Trader Joe's in China. If you have registered, so you, you told me that you have registered, so I keep it without translating, because otherwise they will not recognize you, and also probably you'll violate the commercial rules there in China. And then we also use the localized language. For example, uh, it's high quality or low price, and then we have really traditional expressions for that, and we adopt it. For example, Wu Mei Jia Li means like it's really good value, and then you have low price, and so people is more familiar with it. Um, she's actually very good at presenting, lying through her teeth, uh, as one does. Okay, but she has been able to give the client advice on trademark protection. She knows something about the different laws in the different countries, and according to this, I will adapt or not your, your, your particular trademark and slogan. Uh, she can explain the Chinese options and say why she's going for one expression rather than another. This is doing it. This is selling the product to somebody who doesn't know what's in the product, and she's gaining lots of credibility. Uh, not so much the way she does it, although she's not too bad at presenting it, but the selection of content and making it accessible. These are things we have to do in the industry. We're dealing with clients who don't know about what we do. We have to get our credibility before anything else we do in the industry. And an exercise like this is simply to make people aware of it. It's a video of, of in this case, the client company. Uh, what's interesting is this company, it's a German girl who lived in Australia, uh, a Mexican girl living in California, Argentine from Argentina, a professional translator who'd come back and wanted some retraining, and a Korean girl. So that that was mixed. Okay, uh, but they're there discussing which of the three companies they're going to select. Uh, in this case, the German girl did know a bit of Chinese and was explaining why she really liked one presentation more than the others. The people who learn the most from this exercise are the client companies. Because they've seen three different people, two different companies, groups, present the same product three times. And they get a real feeling for what works. The next week when we reverse the roles, the presentations are much better, much more focused, much more concise, because they've seen what sells. So often putting people in the role of client teaches them more about negotiations than saying, you are a translator, you should act this way. And they figure that out for themselves. Very good. Um, I do one other activity that does concern uh, risk analysis. Just, I admit I've been working on this in my research, so I'm not above using the class to help me with the research, okay? if I think it's of interest to the students at the same time. Um, I do give them, for example, this is a text. 
It's from an interview uh, by an interview of, of a person who recently became CEO of Kodak. And the interviewer is asking him about his new job. Now, this was used in an experiment by Dan Majil for conference interpreters. He had conference interpreters render this text twice. They could show that the second time they did it, they redistributed their effort differently. So he, his hypothesis was what he calls a tightrope hypothesis, that conference interpreters are perpetually on a tightrope, and if they have added capacity, they'll use it up. Okay, so that, that's of interest to conference interpreters. My interest was different. I was intrigued by the fact that the conference interpreters used omission regularly as a strategy. And they did it intelligently, because that's the way it works. Don't tell anybody, but you, know, you leave the bits out. And, uh, and, and Jill had categorized errors and omissions as the same thing. For me, an omission need not be an error. There are strategic omissions which, which, which are useful. And the conference interpreters didn't omit what I call high-risk items and did omit low-risk items. And then when they had more processing capacity the second time around, because you know the text, they restored the medium text omission. The, the ones they undid were stuff that was important. But intuitively, they're able to figure out in the text what is low risk, what is high risk, and what's in between. That's what intrigued me. So I actually get it, and I asked the students to go through and put in red everything that is high risk. That if there's a mistake there, the whole thing will not work. Okay? And it's not a lot. Some here, some up there, and this, this center terminological piece, which is you know, where he thinks they should go. Okay, so that, that's, that's in broad red. And then in green, the stuff where you could make a mistake and things would not go wrong in the communicative event. Okay? And most of it's green. And then we compare about how people assess risk. Once again, my Chinese students, lots of red everywhere. My Western students, lots of green. Okay. Uh, okay. It's an activity to make people aware of risk analysis. They're doing a, a global discourse analysis of the communicative event. The aim of the training at that level of risk is to avoid underwork, guesswork, and avoid overwork. This is what a lot of students are doing in their first year and even in their second year. They're, they're putting in high effort for a low chance of adverse effect. They're, they're working too hard on low risk problems, if you like. And I've tried to do exercise that moves students to low effort for low risk problems, high effort for high risk problems. There's some evidence in the research comparing novices and professionals that this is what happens. That professionals don't really go faster <coughs> over the whole text, they distribute their effort. They go fast where it doesn't count and invest more effort on the high risk of problems that are there. So that, in theoretical terms, would be the aim of the kind of pedagogy that I'm trying to develop. I think that's it. The lesson, work hard when there's high risk, don't work hard when there's low risk.